From Chapter 2 Summary of the Story After Mr. Darling ties Nana outside in the yard, he and Mrs. Darling go to their office party, leaving the three children alone in the nursery. While Mr. and Mrs. Darling were away, Peter Pan and Tinkerbell came in and visited the children. The three children flew away to Never Never Land to go and live with Peter Pan and have adventures with him. But Mr. Darling and Mrs. Darling were devastated when they returned home and found that their beloved children were gone. Mr. and Mrs. Darling never quite got over the loss of their children. For weeks afterwards, they used to talk about that night and all the things that they did wrong. I ought to have been specially careful on a Friday, Mrs. Darling used to say afterwards to her husband. Perhaps, well, well, perhaps Nana was on the other side of her, holding Miss Darling's hand with her paw. No, no, Mr. Darling always said. I am responsible for it all. I, George Darling, did it. Mia culpa, mia culpa. Mia culpa means my fault in the ancient Latin language. Mr. Darling, being a well-respected man, had had a classical education. They sat in the same way night after night, recalling that fatal Friday till every detail of it was stamped on their brains and they could remember it backwards and forwards. If only we had not accepted that invitation to the dinner party, Mrs. Darling said. If only I had not poured my medicine into Nana's bowl, said Mr. Darling. Nana was a dog. She couldn't talk. But she looked at Mr. and Mrs. Darling, and her eyes seemed to send a message. If only I had pretended to like the medicine, was what Nana's wet eyes said. My liking for parties, George. My fatal gift of humor, dearest. My touchiness about trifles, dear master and mistress. Then one or more of them would break down into tears altogether. Nana would always cry when she, th when she thought, it's true, it's true, they ought not to have had a dog for a nurse. And when Nana cried, many a time it was Mr. Darling who put the handkerchief to Nana's eyes. From chapter 16. Summary of the story. It has now been many weeks that the children have been gone. They have had many adventures with Peter Pan and Tinkerbell and fought many pirates in Never Never Land. But their parents are still miserable at home. The children had been away for many weeks, but the house was more or less exactly as they had left it all those nights ago. The only change to be seen in the night nursery is that between nine and six, the kennel was no longer there. When the children had flown away, Mr. Darling had felt in his bones that all the blame was his for having chained Nana up, and that from first to last, Nana had been wiser than he. Of course, as we have seen, he was quite a simple man, but he had also a noble sense of justice and a lion's courage to do what seemed right to him. If the dog had been smarter than he was, then his punishment would be to trade places with the dog. And having thought the matter out with anxious care, 
he went down on all fours and crawled into the kennel. Mrs. Darling tried many times to convince him to come out, but in response to all Mrs. Darling's dear invitations to him to come out, he replied sadly but firmly, No, dear one, this is the place for me. In the bitterness of his remorse, he swore that he would never leave the kennel until his children came back. Of course, this was a pity, but whatever Mr. Darling did, he had to do in excess. Otherwise, he soon gave up doing it. And although Mr. Darling had once been very proud, now he was the most humble man ever, as he sat in the kennel and every evening talked with his wife about their children and all their children's pretty ways. Very touching was Mr. Darling's deference to Nana. He now obeyed Nana in everything and always followed her wishes. The one exception was the kennel. Mr. Darling refused to allow Nana to come back into the kennel, which he said was now his home. Every morning, the kennel was carried with Mr. Darling in it to a cab, which brought him to his office, and he returned home in the same way at six. If we, re if we remember how sensitive Mr. Darling used to be to the opinions of his neighbors, we can see how much of a sacrifice this was for him and marvel at his new strength of character. In the past, Mr. Darling would have been horrified if he knew the neighbors were talking about him. But now that he lived in a kennel, his every movement attracted a surprise attention. Inwardly, he must have suffered torture, but he preserved a calm exterior even when the young criticized his little home. And he always lifted his hat courteously to any lady who looked inside the kennel. It may have been misguided, but it was magnificent. At first, everyone laughed at the man in the kennel, but then a strange thing happened. The story of the Darling family became known to the public. People learned that he was living in the kennel because he was punishing himself for his children's disappearance. And once the inward meaning of the kennel leaked out, the great heart of the public was touched. Crowds began following Mr. Darling's cab, cheering it lustily. Beautiful young girls climbed into Mr. Darling's cab to get his autograph. Stories about Mr. Darling began appearing in the high-class newspapers. Everyone was eager for an interview with Mr. Darling, and he was at once a hero of high-class society. Mr. Darling soon began being invited to the finest society dinner parties, and the invitations added, Do come in the kennel. One Thursday afternoon, Mrs. Darling was in the night nursery, awaiting George's return home. She was now a very sad-eyed woman. The gaiety of her old days was all gone now, because she had lost her children. There was no one else in the room but Nana. Nana and Mrs. Darling were sitting together, Nana's paw on Mrs. Darling's hand when the kennel was brought back. Mr. Darling put his head out of the kennel to kiss his wife. His face is older than before, but it now has a softer expression. Mr. Darling gave his hat to Liza, who took it scornfully. Liza was a woman with no imagination, 
and she was completely incapable of understanding the motives of Mr. Darling. Outside the crowd, who had accompanied the, who had accompanied the cab home, were still cheering, and Mr. Darling was naturally not unmoved. Listen to them, he said. It is very gratifying. It is a lot of little boys, sneered Liza. That's not true. There were several adults today, Mr. Darling assured her with a faint blush. But when Liza tossed her head in disgust, he had not a word of reproof for her. Social success had not spoiled him. It had made him sweeter. For some time, he sat with his head out of the kennel, talking with Mrs. Darling of the great crowds who cheered him on. She said he hoped his head would not be turned by all of this attention he was getting from society. And he pressed her hand reassuringly. No, of course not, he assured her. I'll never let it go to my head. I'm much too strong for that. Of course, it would be different if I had been a weak man. Good heavens, if I had been a weak man, just think what all of this attention could do to me. And George, she said timidly, you are as full of remorse as ever, aren't you? Full of remorse as ever, dearest. See my punishment, living in a kennel. But it is punishment, isn't it, George? You are sure you are not enjoying it. My love, he exclaimed. How could you say such a thing? She begged his pardon at once, and then, feeling drowsy, he curled round in the kennel. Won't you play me to sleep, he asked on the nursery piano. And as she was crossing to the, to the day nursery, he added thoughtlessly, and shut that window. I feel a cold wind. Oh, George, never ask me to do that. The window must always be left open for them. Always, always. Now it was his turn to beg her pardon. And she went into the day nursery and played, and soon he was asleep. And while he slept, Wendy and John and Michael flew into the room, returning at last from all their adventures in Never Never Land. Wendy and John and Michael found the window open for them, which of course was more than they deserved. They landed on the floor. Perhaps they should have felt ashamed for all the worry they had caused their parents. But actually, they were quite unashamed of, them, of themselves. They were, after all, only children and were naturally careless and thoughtless, as all children are. They had been away for so long that they had almost forgotten their home. And in fact, the youngest one, Michael, actually had already forgotten. John, he said, looking around him doubtfully, I think I have been here before. Of course you have, you silly. This is your old bed. So it is, Michael said but not with much conviction. I say, cried John, the kennel, and he dashed across to look into it. Perhaps Nana is inside it, Wendy said. But John whistled. Hello, he said, there's a man inside it. It's father, exclaimed Wendy. Let me see father, Michael begged eagerly and he took a good look. He is not so big as the pirate I killed, he said, 
with such frank disappointment that I am glad Mr. Darling was asleep. It would have been sad if those had been the first words he had heard his little Michael say. Wendy and John had been taken aback somewhat at finding their father in the kennel. Surely, said John, like one who had lost faith in his memory. He didn't used to sleep in the kennel, did he? John, Wendy said falter falteringly, perhaps we don't remember the old life as well as we thought we did. A chill fell upon them, and served them right. It is very, very careless of mother, said that young scoundrel John, not to be here when we come back. It was then that Mrs. Darling began playing the piano again. It's mother, cried Wendy, peeping. So it is, said John. Let us creep in, John suggested, and put our hands over her eyes. But Wendy, who saw that they must break the joyous news more gently, had a better plan. Let us all slip into our beds and be there when she comes in, just as if we had never been away. And so, when Mrs. Darling went back to the night nursery to see if her husband was asleep, all the beds were occupied. The children waited for her cry of joy, but it did not come. She saw them, but she did not believe they were there. You see, she saw them in their beds so often in her dreams that she thought this was just the dream hanging around her still. She sat down in the chair by her fire, by the fire, where in the old days she had nursed them. They could not understand this, and a cold fear fell upon all three of them. Mother, Wendy cried. That's Wendy, she said, but still she was sure it was the dream. Mother, that's John, she said. Mother, cried Michael. He remembered her now. That's Michael, she said, and she stretched out her arms for the three little selfish children they would never hug again. Yes, they did. They went round Wendy and John and Michael, who had slipped out of bed and run to her. George, George, she cried when she could speak. And Mr. Darling woke to share her bliss, and Nana came rushing in. There could not have been a lovelier sight, but there was none to see it except a little boy who was staring in at the window. He had had ecstasies innumerable that other children can never know, but he was looking through the window at the one joy from which he must be forever barred.